Cantwell Cliffs is a tourist trap. The winter is slightly better, and snowy days even more so. That's when I always try to go. I live nearby, and I've had enough of the summer crowds for one lifetime. My friend Sarah had never been before, so we decided to go this past Valentine's Day, since we both had the day off and would otherwise be spending the holiday alone. When the forecast turned from flurries to snow to a possible weather emergency, we thought about canceling our trip. But we had ice cleats, and she drove a jeep, so we thought what the hell. We'd been planning the trip for weeks, and we weren't going to let a little snow ruin it. When we got there, it didn't disappoint. The parking lot was completely empty, a sight I didn't think I'd ever see. Two in the afternoon, and not only was there not a car in sight, but there weren't even any tire tracks. Granted, the snow was still falling, and about to turn dangerous in a few hours, so maybe we shouldn't have been out there either. But damn, it was beautiful. Sarah, I told her, you could come here a hundred more times, and you might never see it empty like this again. We started walking, and even despite what happened that day, I'd never seen it look so lovely. The snow had stuck to every branch of every tree. There were lots of pine trees, which gave the forest a ton of green even in the midst of winter. If I didn't know we were in the Midwest, just by looking at it, I would have guessed Alaska or Canada, somewhere much farther north. The start of the trail can be hard to spot, even with the markers. It was at the edge of a cliff and began at a steep staircase that ran through a crevice in the rock. There were a few old snowed over footprints approaching the edge of the staircase and even one on the top stair. But whoever had approached the steps had quickly decided it was not the right kind of weather to be hiking in. You sure you're up for this? I asked her. Heck yeah, she said. This is nothing. Easy peasy. Even with our ice cleats, it was tough. The ice and snow had frozen on the already weathered shallow steps, so it was basically just a ramp to the bottom, and without the spikes on our shoes, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Sarah fell near the bottom and slid about five feet before she could catch her footing again. Easy peasy, huh? I asked her, and she just brushed the snow off her pants and smiled. That did make me rethink the hike, and I almost suggested turning back. But we were here, and we'd already done the toughest part of the trail, so why not keep going? We started out walking under the cliffs past a few waterfalls. Most of the falls down here just trickle unless the rain is heavy, but in the winter the ice freezes over itself in thick sheets, creating the illusion of a roaring, formidable waterfall. Sometimes the ice connects with the ground. Sometimes it just hangs in perilous stalactites with a pillar of bubbled blue ice at the bottom. I snapped a few pictures with my camera, some of the only ones I'd taken down here without people in them. You think it's too icy for the rim trail? Sarah asked me. I mean, the trail's technically one way, so we kind of have to do it, right? I responded. Don't worry, the path doesn't go too close to the cliffs. If you think it's safe, I'm game. She replied. Sarah wasn't from the Midwest, so she didn't know the area as well. When we first started hiking, I'd have to reassure her that we didn't need bear mace or rattlesnake boots, and yes, one bottle of water would be plenty. There really weren't any dangers in our part of the wilderness, apart from the occasional homeless camp. She'd sometimes ask about urban legends, too, if she should bring her EVP, or if we ever saw Bigfoot out here. And I'd tell her I didn't believe in that stuff. Until we were hiking a bit too close to sunset, or heard an animal scream I didn't recognize, then sometimes I'd believe in that stuff a little bit. Anyway, we took some slippery steps up to the trail and started climbing elevation a bit, rising near the top of the tree line that we'd just been underneath. I'd done the trail countless times over the years, and it always seemed higher up in the winter. The naked branches made it easier to see down, off the sides of the cliffs, though we didn't venture too close to the edges. There was a small open-faced cabin overlooking one of the cliffs, and we sat for a minute, reading the graffiti and eating granola bars. It was mostly initials carved into hearts. We found one that said T plus S, and I joked with her that it was a sign we were both playing for the wrong team. We were just putting our water back in our bags, when we heard it, a very faint, help, came from somewhere ahead of us. 
I was almost thinking I'd imagined it, but it repeated louder. Help! Followed by, Hello? Again, coming from ahead of us. Coming from down the cliff. We looked at each other with wide eyes and walked closer, stopping a few feet from the edge. You didn't want to get too close in the winter. It was impossible to tell what was rock and what was snow, ready to fall and take you with it. Hello, Sarah said. Hello, the voice answered back. Help me, please help me. I got this, I told her. I grabbed a stick, got down on my stomach, crawled forward, and poked the snow ahead of me to make sure there was still solid ground ahead. Eventually, I could peer over the edge. There was a man down at the bottom of the cliff, and when I saw him, I knew in a quick, harsh way that he was not okay. His arms and legs were twisted up, and he was sprawled out on the ground. No blood that I could see, but that didn't mean much. He was wearing a light green coat and pants that looked torn and dirty. I gasped when I saw him, but steadied my voice and yelled, Don't worry, we'll go get help. Please wait. He cried, Don't leave me alone. I glanced back at Sarah, who said, I can go. She was definitely more in shape than me. She was a runner. In a pinch, she'd get back faster. All right, you might get reception on the way back. Turn your phone on loud. It'll blow up with emails and stuff when you hit reception. She nodded. If you don't get it on the trail, you'll get it driving out of here, maybe on the first hill. She swung her pack over her shoulder and said, I'll be fast. All right, go. I said, and she was gone. Don't worry. I yelled down. I'm still here. The wind had died down during my brief conversation with Sarah, and I could hear much more clearly when he replied, Thank God. And look, my friend's going to get help. I told him. Then, even though I didn't believe it, I said, You're going to be okay. I reached under my stomach and moved a few sticks out of the way, settling into the cold snow. When I peered over the edge again, I got a better look at him. His arm was folded over, and it looked too short, like it had snapped before his elbow and folded over twice, just in a horrible bundle. His other arm was tucked under him, and his legs looked off. Neither of them were bending the right way. But he was talking. That was a good sign. My eyes wandered to the snow around him, and it looked disturbed, like he'd tried to drag himself around. What's your name? He asked. It's Tim, I told him. What's yours? I pulled my hat down a bit. The cold was getting to me more now that I wasn't moving around. Tim, he echoed, ignoring my question. Then he asked. Are you alone up there, Tim? Yeah, I responded. My friend went to go get help. I tried to sound reassuring. That's good, he said. Then quieter. That's very good. How long have you been down there? I asked him. Oh, a long time, he said. And I thought, yeah, no shit. He must have been there at least a day. There hadn't been any other tire tracks on the lot. And then I thought, wait a second, where was his car? I've been down here so long, Tim, he said, interrupting my thoughts. I wiggled closer to the ground, trying to get lower down to avoid the sudden rush of wind that was back in the forest. I knew it was just the cold, but when he said my name, the way he said my name, it made me feel even more cold. I immediately felt bad for that thought. He was clearly delirious. But nonetheless, something about him was unsettling. And I've been so alone down here. He crooned. There was something else bothering me. Why hadn't we seen any footprints going down those stairs at the start of the trail? Well, don't worry, I said, peering back over the edge again. 
you're not alone anymore. No, he said, shuffling slightly. I'm not. I was about to tell him not to move around when my eyes locked onto the snow around him. The way that it was disturbed, it wasn't like he'd been crawling around. There were footprints leading up to his body and coming from deep into the forest. And with that, he sat up. My eyes widened with the awful but confusing realization that he hadn't fallen. He'd walked there. And I laid there for a second trying to make sense of things. He must have been trying to distract me for some reason. I thought about those stories you hear about people on the sides of the road with a baby or a broken down car who flag you down only to distract you long enough for the rest of their crew to come out of the woods or block you in on the road. I looked behind me, certain that someone would be closing in, but there wasn't anyone there. I looked back again one more time, ready to stand up and run. But what I saw froze me in place. He was standing up, but he was standing up on legs that were still backwards, the knees bending out behind him. And then his arms unfurled. The bends I'd interpreted as broken bones were just a ruse to disguise how long his arms were. They just kept getting longer as they straightened out. And at the ends, his hands that had been covered with the snow were now visible. The fingers incredibly long with black points at the end that I could only assume were claws. And then he walked up closer to the cliff and I lost sight of him. It was concave at the bottom. I heard an awful scraping sound. And in just seconds, I saw his head peer around a ledge higher up the cliff. Peekaboo, he said in a sing-song voice. He was climbing up the side of the cliff. I got up and I ran as fast as I could on the snow and ice. It felt like trying to run in a dream, my feet sticking and slipping with every step. And I was going so slow, even under the best conditions, I couldn't have outrun him. Even the wind was working against me. It must have been at least 20 miles an hour pushing me back towards that terrible drop off. I heard crunching in the snow behind me, and I knew he'd cleared the cliff. I ran a few more steps, and then I slipped on the ice like some idiot in a horror movie. Before I could get up, I felt claws on my back. I didn't think my heart could beat any faster, but I went into overdrive as he said, Caught you, Tim. He dragged me back with ease, and I kicked and yelled and I fought for my life. But it didn't faze him. This creature, whatever it was, his claws were digging into my sides, and every kick and punch I hit him with drove them in deeper. But I didn't stop. He dragged me past the cabin, and I tried to grab it. And as we got closer to the edge of the cliff, I dug my fingers into the ice. But it did nothing. The creature threw me over its shoulder as it prepared to descend my feet up in the air. I grabbed a small tree growing on the side of the cliff, and I put all my strength into just holding on. Oh, come on now, Tim, I won't drop you, he said, pulling me. And I looked at him, really looked at his face for the first time. It looked human, but it was so pale and his eyes were an icy blue, almost white. His arms were so cold, deathly cold, and his clothes, they were too small. His jacket had little blue flowers embroidered on it. There were holes on the side and down the front, like it had been ripped off. I kicked madly at the ice above us, keeping a death grip on the tree. By luck, or maybe the divine intervention of some god, if you believe in that sort of thing. The ice cracked. The creature looked up what could possibly be a surprise on its dead face, and fell. It let go of me, instinctively putting its arms up with their terrible claws to protect itself. 
I held onto the tree for dear life as the ice slid away, just inches from taking the small tree with it. Blue stalactites of ice taller than me fell with the creature, and I found myself hoping that they would fall on top of it, impaling its horrible body. I clambered up the edge of the cliff with an agility I didn't know I possessed, and I ran. It was painfully slow, but the wind had died down a bit. I didn't hear anything behind me, but I didn't slow down. After five or maybe ten minutes of running on the ice, I found Sarah. She was limping along, trying to get up a staircase. Sarah, I said. She looked back, a slight embarrassed look on her face, and I gathered that she must have been walking too fast and messed up her ankle. I caught up to her and told her, We need to get out of here now. What about that guy? She asked. He said he didn't want to be left alone. Then a dark look passed over her face, and she asked, Did he... I mean, is he? He's not dead. I paused. At least I don't think so. I'll tell you about it in the car. We need to go. I thought about telling her the truth. I did, but this was slowing us down and I needed her to have more of a sense of urgency. So I told her something more plausible, what I'd first thought was happening when I saw those footprints. He wasn't hurt, Sarah. It was some kind of distraction. He didn't fall, he walked there. I think there might be more people in the woods. I think he was trying to keep us here for something. She got the picture then. We got out of there as fast as we could with her ankle, and I practically had to push her up the last set of stairs. I don't know how it didn't catch up to us, and I figured that it must have been dead, or at least hurt. We made it out, and I got behind the wheel. The snow was falling again, and the drive was tense. I'd never driven Sarah's car, and the roads were windy and icy. We came dangerously close to running off the road twice, but I wasn't afraid of getting into a car wreck. No, I was afraid of what would find us if we ended up stranded by the side of the road. I took Sarah to the hospital, and I told her that I'd filed the police report while she was in there. I wish I could have done something, told someone. But who the hell do you tell about something like that? Something impossible? I spent a long time googling the history of that area. Any creatures or ghosts or anything similar to what I saw. But there was nothing. I looked at the previous deaths there, wondering if there had been a man who'd fallen from the cliffs and matched his description. But I didn't find anything. But then again, in the wilderness you could never be sure. The scavengers could have moved his body. But I don't know if that thing was a ghost. What kind of ghost can climb up a wall and grab people? I was going to let it go, move on with my life as usual, just without ever going hiking again. But then I saw the news later that week. Someone had died at Cantwell Cliffs. They'd fallen from the tops of one of the cliffs. And worse still, They'd been out the same day as us. The story had popped up on my phone while I was looking at it before bed, and when I saw the title, I turned on my lights and went to go double check that the door was in fact locked. A girl had been out hiking during the snowstorm, just an hour or so after we'd left. She was an experienced hiker. She'd been mountain climbing and exploring in areas much more dangerous than here. Her family was baffled at how she would have fallen. Then I got down to her injuries. Her right arm was broken in multiple places, and her legs had both snapped backwards. Which, yes, I know could have just been a coincidence. But it gets worse. She was wearing a green coat that none of her family remembered her owning. There wasn't a picture, but they described it as being distinctive as it had blue flowers embroidered into it. She had puncture wounds on her side, and her injuries were so extensive that the autopsy had initially been released in case there had been foul play involved. But no, the coroner had ruled that she must have fallen, and the cause of death was actually hypothermia. The article ended with her brother, talking about how horrible it was. She must have been down there for hours before succumbing to the cold. 
He'd said, I just can't stop thinking about her, being out there alone for so long. But he's wrong. I don't think she was alone. I think she had the company of the horrible creature as she lay dying in the snow. I vividly remembered his voice chiding, I won't drop you. And I found myself wondering if she'd fallen or if he'd taken her down the cliff and broken her bones himself. They took down the article a little while later. After they determined there wasn't foul play, her family didn't want the graphic autopsy report out there anymore. Local news like that can be hard to find, and if I hadn't seen it in that week, I might never have. It made me wonder how many other deaths had happened there that just aren't reported online. I wondered how many others had those same injuries. Eventually, I came up with a theory. The creature was feeling well enough to snatch another person just after me and Sarah left. It should have been able to come after us. We were going so slow. And there are no legends, no sightings, no nothing of this thing. If it lives there, or haunts there, or however it exists, there should be something. I wonder if maybe it only frequents the trail when the crowds are gone and lone hikers can be found on the trail. Perhaps it only hunts prey that's alone. Alone, like it kept saying it didn't want to be. And I guess for a few hours that day, when it had the company of a dying girl, it wasn't alone. And neither was she.